Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today, we will not talk about MDR again, or about IVDR. We will talk about a specific process that normally every uh, medical device manufacturer should understand and have on their quality management system, which is a process validation. So I'm here today with Adnan Ashfak, uh, which is the founder and principal consultant at Farmy Med uh, LTD uh, in the UK. And it will help us really to uh, understand this process. So welcome Adnan to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hello, good afternoon and good afternoon to all your listeners. Thank you very much for having me, Munir. Thank you. Thank you for that. So Adnan, uh, we had a discussion, I think, last week, if I remember well, uh, where yeah. we just discussed about our experiences. And at one point, you told me about your uh, process validation experience. Uh, it was, I think, one of your first experience when you started uh, consulting. And we really, I really recognize myself also because I was also uh, working as a process validation engineer. Uh, and there was a lot of things that were uh, really uh, similar to us. And yeah. uh, I'll ask you if you can come and really uh, provide your experience about what is a process validation. Maybe also to, to some people like engineers that want to go to this path and really want to understand how maybe to be successful or what they have really to understand about process validation. But before that, uh, can you make an introduction of yourself uh, and then we can start with the questions. Absolutely. So once again, so th thanks for um, having me on the, the show. Um, and so uh, as you said, you know, I'm the principal consultant and the founder of Farmimed Limited, which I established around eight years ago. Um, before that, I've been in the medical device industry since uh, 2000. So it's been 20 years, in fact, 1999. So this is the 21st year. Okay. <laughs> so I've gone past over two decades into my third decade. Um, and yes, so the, my first experience of medical devices actually came into validation. So the first 10 years of these 20, 21 years has been heavy, heavy validation. So I, as my background, <clears throat> typically you find people in the medical devices industry, they either have a scientist background or an engineering background. So I'm personally, I am an engineer. Um, I graduated as a manufacturing engineer. Uh, so understood a bit more about the mechanical and the electrical and production. So I already had quite a good grasp of um, production processes. So it set me, uh, I think, quite nicely into understanding validation. So when my first role came about in validation, um, uh, I'll prob I won't name any companies, but a company that you also work for as well. Okay. Um, uh, also, it was for very new for them about validation, although uh, equipment had been in this company for many, many years, um, but never done, done any validation. So of course, as we know, under the regulatory authorities, the FDA in particular, are very, very keen to ensure that processes have been validated. So it's a very hot subject, um, especially back then, and it is now possibly even more so. Um, in validation for processes which are manufacturing uh, medical devices is critical um, to ensure the stability, ensuring repeatability uh, and consistency of device quality. So what is it exactly, you know, so there's a lot, a, a lot that we can discuss and cover, but we have limited time. So yeah. Yeah, it's limited what we can discuss. Yeah, I, I remember we, when we discussed, you said, yeah, you can make hours of discussion about that. So I will try to guide you on the discussion to make it really concise. So for yeah. the audience and to. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. leave that to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, just wanted maybe to, to start with the first, uh, first question. So um, we talk about process validation, but, uh, do you, I mean, can you recommend or can you explain if there is many different types of process validation or validation techniques, if I can say, for medical device companies? Yeah, so, I mean, the first thing I was going to actually talk to you about was, uh, I mean, the validation, uh, uh, I looked just before we came onto the call, in ISO 13485, the term validation pops up 53 times. Yeah. Um, and specifically, what we're looking at here is clause 7.5.6, uh, which is the clause for validation of processes, so specifically that. However, what's also interesting is when people understand validation, we can mean several different areas of validation. It could be utilities, facilities validation, yeah. supplier validation, process validation, uh, it can be um, equipment validation, cleaning validation, sterilization validation, product validation, computer software validation, and lab or analytical validation. So these are around 10 different subject areas where validation uh, should be performed in one way or another. 
And the concept of validation is to ensure that quality consistency has been met no matter whichever way we're looking at it. So let's focus on processes as yeah. that is the main subject area that we're looking at. So um, there's lots of tools that you can use within uh, performing validation and process validation itself is because it's such a big area. Uh, we look at the design qualification, um, IQ, OQ, PQ. These are buzz terms that people hear about, but yet they don't know en enough or anything about when do you start so, it. And so then, so can, you, can you just maybe uh, uh, tell to people what means IQ, what means OQ, what means PQ, just maybe to make it more friendly to them? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So IQ is installation qualification. So let's say installing a piece of machinery or equipment or some process that's been installed. You have to then do the, the qualification check. So it's almost like a checklist. Have we been through the checklist to make sure that the mains, any gas or any air or any electricity has been checked? We All these things have to be checked, calibration. And then we go to OQ, operational so qualification. Just, just one thing for the for the installation qualification. I, I make it uh, always as example is the fact that, you know, when you are receiving an equipment at home, like a TV or like a, a microwave or whatever, there is yeah. this instruction that says to you how you have to install your device and that nobody is looking at. <laughs> so exactly. That's an excellent point. So it's exactly that. Point. But yeah. here the medical device industry so we have to look at that and we have to understand yeah. what the manufacturer says in terms of installation how many electrical uh, power i have to provide how yeah. many pressure or things i have to yeah. put to the machine to be sure that it will be working properly exactly so only once we've done that we can move on to oq so it exactly. has to be on stage by stage by stage not OQ before IQ or not PQ before IQ or OQ. It has to be done in this sequence. So IQ, installation qualification, OQ, operational qualification, and then PQ, performance qualification. Yeah. This is the natural step and the process. Okay. So, so the, the, and, and, and each of those stages have got an enormous amount of work that has to be done. Um, so there's no cutting corners. And, and, and it's, it's really important, I think, to say that because uh, you are hearing, I mean, I, I, ha I had also to deal with some uh, executives and management that were saying, oh, uh, can you do that within one week because we have to deliver everything, etc. Yeah. I mean, I think you don't understand really what it is because <laughs> one, week, one week to do all this process is not really possible. But it's, it's something that can be taking a lot of time. You can fail a validation, mm. we have to redo it again. So it's also something that executives don't want to hear at all. Uh, yeah. So th there is a lot of things like that. So um, I am, if I can say, I want to be, I mean, I want to risk myself and be a validation engineer. So yeah. <laughs> what do you think, I mean, if for people that are maybe listening and say, oh yes, I want to be a validation engineer, what kind of soft skill or skills they need to have or to understand or to think about before applying to this type of jobs? So I, I, I think um, there's no one way to uh, become a validation engineer. I have trained uh, people to become validation engineers who have come from a biomedical engineering um, undergraduate background. They can be chemistry or, uh, or any um, science-based or engineering background. But I think fundamentally what helps is, is analytical thinking. Okay. is having an analytical mind and some logical process to understand because the person that has this way of thinking usually uh well the whole procedure of process validation is one of uh, logical thinking it's not back to front it, it actually makes sense when you think about it yeah so i think having that general understanding and that quality of skill i think is important if you have an engineering background it will definitely help um, whether me mechanical, electrical, software, even having uh, some chemistry or science background can also help. Because if we look at it, people often ask me what I do. And I tell them, as a medical engineering consultant, how do I explain this? So I say it's a combination of three things, medical, engineering, and law. <laughs> like Would it. you agree? Yeah, I agree. I mean, you have you have to be a kind of I call that a lawyer for the products or a lawyer for the process exactly. because you have to understand what are the requirements and provide the strategy to a company to fulfill those requirements and being still compliant. So yeah, yeah it's like uh, being the lawyer for for your processes. That's right. 
So I think the same thing with validation engineering, because you're following the letter of the law and guidance documents, there's legal areas that you need to be able to understand. And having the medical background because of the devices that we're manufacturing are medical devices and knowing that patient safety is at risk at the end of the medical devices is also very, very important. And sometimes you even need to understand the characteristics. So having the science understanding and background can also help. And the engineering, of course, because we're dealing with equipment, um, uh, electrical equipment, mechanical equipment, which have lots of moving parts that need to be checked, tested and validated. Yeah, so and one thing that I also noticed because as I've said, I work on the, on this area is also that you have also to have some kind of communication skill with some with the peoples because you have to ah. tell them what you are doing. You have to explain to, to them why you are doing that. Uh, you have to educate <clears throat> them a bit on the process and things Very. because at the end you can validate whatever you want if the guy in the other side is doing wrong with yeah. the machine at the end. All what you have well, done is for nothing. I can tell you a few stories about that where you have to be very diplomatic because you can upset lots of people if you <laughs> do it wrongly. <laughs> because first of all, um, if we think about a, a, a factory, a manufacturing facility that's been running for hours and sometimes all the people are interested in is getting product out the door. Yeah. Right? Suddenly you come along and say, we've got to do validation. Now we're going to stop production for how many hours? Eight hours, 24 hours? Uh, much more than that. It could be several days, several weeks, and that's going to put a production stop. So a team leader who's in charge of production line is only interested in getting products and units out the door because they have to meet the targets. And suddenly you're going to do, stop that. That's going to jeopardize their uh, figures and throughput. So that's not a good thing. So to try and win them and get their, their buy-in is very important. So I think those communication skills that you mentioned are absolutely imperative. Yeah, the and I, I have this experience that you mentioned about uh, uh, dealing with the production manager that have to get the things out. Uh, but yeah, as I said, as soon as you educate them, you explain to them, you you are you are really empathetic with them. You understand that yes, they have to deliver, and it's your yeah. job also to help them to deliver uh, right products and as quick as possible because there are patients that are waiting on the other side. But they yeah. have also to understand that there is some risks actually with the process, uh, the actual process, and we have to make it better. So it's it's an investment. You have really yeah. to, to see it as an investment for future. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you have to have a good communication skill. <laughs> you can, I mean, you have to have, if you are, yeah, good, good, good. If you are a young engineer and you are starting with that, I understand yeah. that you can have a lot of difficulties here. That's right. Yeah, so good, good uh, communication skills, trying to be diplomatic also is very, very important as much as right. possible. And I think almost sales skills, because you have to sell the idea. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. So you see, if you are working in quality or regulatory affairs, you don't have only to be uh, focusing on regulation. You have also to have other soft skills uh, to help you, you to, uh, to put, place a product on the market. Yeah. Um, so um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of methodology, so we talked about IQ, OQ, PQ. So um, we said IQ is for installation, OQ is for operational qualification. Can you say in a few words what means operation qualification, and maybe performance qualification? Right. So something before we go on to that, which is actually yeah. linked to the OQ part, which is very yeah. important, which we didn't mention, is factory acceptance, FAT. Ah, yeah, FAT, SAT, yeah, true. FAT, SAT. So... Factory acceptance testing yeah. is an opportunity for the manufacturer even before you install True. the equipment in your facility and before you perform the operational testing that you have done some uh, stress testing at the supplier site before it's been dispatched. And this is actually a tactful uh, arrangement that the uh, manufacturer can have with their supplier to ensure that there's some contractual obligations that the supplier does not release or dispatch the machinery before they have satisfied some level of testing, which will not be the same level as OQ, but it will be some minimized OQ. Uh, so some level of testing, and we call that factory acceptance testing. And only when we've satisfied with that, we can tick the box and set, tell the suppliers to ship the machinery equipment to the site of the manufacturing site. And then we're happy with that. So then we can do that. The site acceptance testing, um, can also be introduced as well, but there's another uh, extra layer. Yeah. Uh, it arrives on the site, and then you do a small check before you install it. So SAT, FAT, SAT, exactly. and then IQ, OQ, PQ. Yeah. So let's move on to OQ. 
So um, just so, just one thing. So yes, uh, this process, as I've said, people hearing only IQ or QPQ, but there is much more, if I can say, out of mm. that. As you mentioned, SAT, FAT is one of thing. You have the user requirements first. I mean, oh, the yeah. normal specification to provide to the, the supplier before that he understand what you need and that he knows exactly what kind of <clears> test you will be doing, etc., etc. So there is a lot of other steps that are that are going on even after PQ. There is some other steps also. So you have to yeah. understand that it's not just three steps; it's a, li a little bit more. More than that, and and in fact, I think what you mentioned about your the user requirements. In fact, I can't stress this enough because although we didn't mention it earlier on, but it, I, for me, it's actually one of the most important. Um, areas which is often missed out because when you think about purchasing a car or a house or any item you have in your mind some specification of exactly. what you're wanting you don't go to the sales showroom or to the market without having a specification in your mind you want a five bedroom house you want a car which is um, uh, for a family or for just two people uh, you have an idea of a color so you already have these specifications and ideas the URS is exactly that, is your user requirement specification to ensure that you're protected, that the equipment or the machine that you're buying or whatever the process comes in to the specification that you need it to be, because otherwise you'll end up with something which is useless. Exactly. And I, I imagine the fact that the, the example that you mentioned about the car, if I, if I want a car that is white, but I didn't put that on the specification that I receive a blue car, then I, it's my fault. It's not the fault of, of the car right. dealer because it's me who hasn't put that as a specification. So I think it's really important. So user requirement specification, uh, FAT, SAT in case, yeah. And then IQ, OQ, PQ, and then we can right. go after that. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. So, just so, for, so, so let's go let's on. go to OQ as you mentioned before. Let's go to OQ. Exactly. So um, the OQ for me is the is the heart of the validation. Uh, not only because it's in the middle of the IQ, OQ, PQ, but also because the purpose of the operational qualification is to stress test the equipment to take the equipment to its outer limits. So let's say you have um, pressure, temperature um, and time, those three parameters. You want to be able to ensure that you have um, an operating window which allows you to manufacture within the operating window and you've tested it within the extremes of the window. So an upper limit and a lower limit because what tends to happen is whether we understand, understand this or not, but fundamental engineering principles will teach you that there's process drift. There's drifting between a process. So the process is not always 100% accurate. So if again, let's think about the car when we're driving on the highway. Sometimes the, the car is moving a little bit to the right and to the left, but you stay within the lane, right? And this is the idea to think about the OQ. Exactly. Is that you're staying within the lane because you tested that the limits, uh, you still give you product which is usable and is acceptable. And that's the purpose of OQ. You stress test it and you put the, the limits. I think I think to put to put as you mentioned those lines uh, in a road, you take a truck maybe as your yeah. <laughs> as your worst case, so that the smaller car can go uh, in this line. So it's maybe take a worst case to say these are my limits because I really uh, arrive to the limits of the road, and then all the rest which is smaller should normally fit on this road. So it's mainly that is how you can validate a process that. Um, what you are validating is helping all the other products that are arriving to enter into this uh, into those limits. So it's um, exactly as you mentioned, it's defining how how large will be this road, and it's what you are defining here. For example, for the temperature, maybe the temperature will be between 10 degrees and 30 degrees. So here is your limit, and you are testing at the upper and lower limit. So it's right. mainly what you what you have to do in OQ. Yeah. And then once we've satisfied that, when we, once we have the satisfactory results from those OQ and we've established the, the window, the, the limits, then we can move on to PQ. Now, PQ is interesting because uh, performance qualification or PQ is when we're going to test for consistency, yeah. um, repeatability. That is, those are the key terms for PQ. And the only way you can do that is that that's when you look at the nominal parameters. So this time we're not going to look at the outer limits, the upper and the lower. We will look at the middle, the nominal parameters. Um, so the not, so we have to look at the, the, the middle range of the temperature, the pressure and the time. So because of the, the drift. So that's when we'll, we'll make sure that we set the, the equipment to those nominal parameters and then we will run the machine. 
And the next question comes is, how long for? Yeah. How long do we run the machine for? And how many batches? This is now we're sampling. Um, so typically the FDA used to have three batches. Yeah. Three was a figure um, because there was a, a saying somewhere that um, first time uh, was the chance, next... <laughs> first time was luck, second time was chance, and third time was validation. Exactly. Is that correct, Manir? <laughs> yeah, <he's correct. laughs> right. So this was this was the rule that the FDA used to give for three batches, and often it's still used as a rule of thumb to yeah, do three I, batches. I've, I've seen that also on the IMDRF uh, guidance, which is saying also three batches. And uh, since then, I saw a lot of times that. But I think you have also to justify why you are taking those three batches, why three right. is sufficient, and how many parts in those three batches um, is also uh, something that yeah. is, is normal for you. So the, 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 the thing that comes now is, um, is, a, is quite a scary fact because for manufacturers, suddenly when they know that they have to run three batches, this can be like thousands in, of product, which is very valuable. Yeah. Because what we're talking about here is the, the, pra the, the equipment has to be run in normal uh, production environment and at norm no nominal parameters under no nothing fixed. It's not an arranged or orchestrated scenario. It's, it should be under normal circumstances. Um, however, one thing which uh, is also done is concurrent validation. So it means that you can the PQ batches that you're using, you can use for saleable product. Yeah. Because if the product is very expensive, very valuable, you cannot destroy the product and use it for validation and then, and then it's useless then you've just destroyed potentially millions of uh, euros, pounds or dollars worth of product. That can be saleable product only until the point where it's, you've done some testing on a batch or sample size. All of the acceptance criteria has been met. The product should be quarantined somewhere safe before the testing results are released. And only upon satisfactory results can you then use that for the saleable product uh, for shipping. So I think you are making some companies uh, happy now <laughs> by saying exactly. That. <laughs> That's the idea. So it's, it's not all it's not all doom and gloom. We have to make them happy. So, so because it's, it's it's true that when 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 we are making this validation plan or validation strategy, we are defining how many products we need to do this validation. And when we give the numbers to the executives to say sign on that, they are really shaking their hands to say yes or no because yeah, exactly. the thing we have to, to scrap everything. But no, yeah. yeah. And making your procedure also a, a, a kind of justification that no, there is some sellable products and and how and as you've said, which condition uh, they have to meet for that. Now yeah. we have this process, but here we are talking as you've said from the beginning: user requirements, FAT, SAT, IQ, QPQ. This is mainly for a new process that we reserve. What about? I mean, I arrive to a company. I am a new validation engineer. Uh, there is some machines there that were here since 20 years that were still working. And what should I do with that? Should I let them like that or should I do a validation also for them? So the, so the, so the thing is, that is the scenario that happens most of the time. Yeah. So most, com <laughs> most companies are in that situation. When they start the validation program, that's often what happens. So what needs to happen is the term that's often used for that is retrospective validation. Yeah. Now, th th this is a term that the FDA didn't like retrospective validation because it can mean two things. It can mean that you are actually using retrospectively manufactured batches okay. and you use the data from that to say that the machines are okay. Okay. This is, this is what the FDA do not like. The other one, which is the correct way, is that you <clears throat> go back to the equipment which has been pre-installed into the, the facility and you validate it almost as if it's new. So it just, it's a term that means you go back and retrospectively, in hindsight, you're validating it. Because the correct pro process is that you validate it from the moment that the machine comes into the company. This is prospective validation. So when we're doing retrospective validation, we need to go back and cover all of, all of the requirements. So, so this man, is what we have Mainly, it means that, for example, for IQ, you have maybe just to check quickly that the requirements of the manufacturer were met. I suppose you have to maybe call back the manufacturers to get the, the instructions or the manual of the equipment yeah. because you have lost it, if I can say. Yeah. Uh, for OQ, um, you have already some parameters. So how are you doing now? You are stressing again new parameters or you are stressing the parameters that are actual? Well, the best thing to do is that you use the parameters that are actually being used at the moment, but you need to verify them. 
So you verify those parameters. However, if you find unacceptable results yeah. at the end of that, then is it tricky? That's when you have to go back and change. So you, according to your company QMS, you should use a change control. An engineering change should be made. You change the parameters and then you retest and then that, those will become the new parameters. This is the normal way. Okay, so um, I think I think here it's it's it will give more work if I can say for those companies. But as we've said, it's really an investment that people have to or companies have to make. Um, when we are saying here, we are, we are talking a lot about do this, do that, etc. Clearly, can you help me to understand who is doing exactly? Is it the validation engineer or is it who, who is the person who is really doing the work? Right. So that, that, that's, that's a good question. So the thing is, um, uh, ultimately, um, the, the process will be responsible for the manufacturing department. So they're, they're responsible. So operations, manufacturing, or whoever is responsible for the products which is coming out of the machine, they're responsible for it. Some companies, what they've done is, if they have enough resource, IQ is done by engineering, OQ is done by quality, and then okay. PQ is done by manufacturing. Okay. Uh, this is a broad way of doing it. If you have the resource and training and people understanding validation, and also if it's going to be a continuous process that you're, that you're on top of and you can maintain it that way. Otherwise, what some companies do is they bring in consultants, they do the one-off validation, and then they hand it over to somebody who is experienced in subject matter expert, maybe from an engineering department that can understand the uh, philosophy or, or the logic behind maintaining validation because that ultimately we have to maintain validation. Exactly. Yeah, it's also a point that I wanted to, to bring here. So I have done my validation. I have my final report. Everything is signed and everything. I mean, should I revisit that regularly or it's just once and then it's <coughs> fine and then I will... I try to lock that down or re put that in an yeah. archive room. I don't see that anymore. <laughs> what's what's uh, happening there? Yeah, well, as, as, as we know, there's nothing in the medical devices industry is archived. It's <laughs> always maintained. It's continuous. It's always continuous. So the, the thing is, until the process is terminated or discharged from a production, it should be maintained and the validation should be maintained. So we have a maintenance program, we have a calibration program, but we also have to have a validation program. So in the company procedures, in the quality management system, we should have somewhere periodic review okay. of validation. So this is a term that we need to understand. Periodic review can be annual, it can be every two years, but it shouldn't be too long because it has to be um, understood of how, how often are you using the machine? If you use the machine maybe once in six months, it doesn't make any sense for you to validate it every year because yeah. you're going to only use it two times. But if you're using it on a regular basis and there's lots of production coming up, perhaps you need to then validate it every year and, and then keep on top of it. So you just to check. And the other thing you need to also check is change controls. Have there been any changes? So what are you doing at the end of the year is the question. That after 12 months, when you do the periodic review, you have done the original validation, but then on top of that, you need to see if there's been any change controls, any kappas, any non-conformances because of the process. So this is what you have to check. Okay, so uh, it's mainly, you have to put in place kind of a monitoring uh, process. So I think when you are saying we have to check, it's not like something that you, you have to define maybe later, you define it now, you check every two months or three months or yeah. six months or this or that, you have to define that in your validation plan and revisit that uh, as, as mentioned. Yeah. I think it's what so, the auditors will be checking if you are, I mean, on the report, they will check uh, if there is something mentioned about uh, frequency of uh, revalidation or recheck so, or monitoring. Yeah, so one of the things that the, the, the auditors will always check, the first thing that they usually ask for is, can you show me your validation master plan? Yeah, true, exactly. Usually the first question, because from the master plan, they will then select some equipment, critical processes, and say, show me your validation for X, Y, and Z. And, and this usually, is where they always start. And they usually take the one that is more recent, the one that is, if I can say, middle age, and the one that is really older. Old, to see really yeah. how, how, they are, how they are doing that. Just yeah. a question in terms of audits. Let's help also the, the industry, or maybe some auditors, <laughs> in, in terms of that. So, um, I mean, you have made 20 years of, uh, of audits or of, of validation. So you know about that, you know about the processes, uh, and you help maybe a lot of companies. So if tomorrow you were hired by a, a notified body or a certification body uh, and you had to audit the validation process, um, what question will you be asking? 
the manufacturer and you will be sure at 90% that they, are, they will fail. So what is the most common failure regarding those processes and uh, an auditor can pick at any time? <coughs> I th to, to be honest, I, I don't think there's one single one, but okay. if we can focus on sampling, sampling is often an, an issue. Is what, where did they come up with a figure that of 50 samples for uh, production, which is manufacturing uh, eight hour shifts, three shifts a day, um, seven days a week? Uh, where did you get that figure from a 50? So I think sampling has got to be one of the key areas where it has to be justifiable because you have to remember that um, the quality management system, uh, ISO 13485 says verification is the default uh, and if you, unless if you cannot verify then you validate. So we want, they want to try and ver verify where possible. But remember verification is also very expensive because it means that somebody has to 100% check the product. Exactly. So the, the benefit of validation is that you're building in quality assurance into the process by sample checking. But it doesn't mean that you sample check, oh, let's just do like maybe one in, one in 100,000. The figure, as they say, can't be from the air. It has to be based on some science. So this is where you can use sampling plans. Exactly. So, so I remember I remember we are using some AQL numbers, some uh, standards yeah. for that, etc. So to define, for example, I mean, in my companies, we're always having the same um, same batch um, batch size. So for example, 500. Yeah. So we had always the same number of samples to pick because it was uh, calculated on the AQL uh, and defining also if it is a critical to quality features to measure yeah. or not critical to quality features. So there is all those mix that you have to define and That's then to right. choose. I mean, it's <laughs> let's say it's scientific <laughs> to have mm. to choose <laughs> the right number and to justify the right number. But it's true that I, I also saw some companies that are picking a, a random number and saying, oh, it looks good. It looks fine. Let's, let's take this number. And then mm. it's, it's where they are mainly failing. Yeah, exactly. So that's a critical area, definitely. Okay. Um, let's, let's now, I think, I think, it's, yeah. I hope now it provides really a big, a good overview for everybody in terms of what is process validation, how they have to execute that, what are the things. So um, as you've said to me, so uh, FarmiMed Limited, you are really <coughs> working uh, there uh, and helping consultants. So what kind of service are you offering to them? So if they, if they need to hire you for helping them? So what, yeah, so one of the things that I've done for a long time is um, because I've done so much validation, it's been coming out of my ears, uh, I created some useful templates for a lot of companies. Um, so templates for FAT, for um, uh, IQ, for OQ, PQ, and even for different packaging machines or uh, even different types of, say, uh, bottling machines where you're bottling. So for also for the pharmaceutical industry, because pharmaceutical industry is where a lot of validation is done uh, also, as well as medical devices. Yeah. Um, so it's also useful for, for the industries where there could be a combination product or something like that where you're using some drugs. So the templates are very useful and um, uh, I have people from all over the world downloading templates all the time, a URS uh, and then validation master plan. So I also have a pack, a validation toolkit, which you can see on, on the website, which is useful. Um, but then after that, if they need any further guidance, then I can also help them by email or phone call or guide them through what's actually needed so that they're making sure that they have followed the regulations. No, I think it's great, uh, and I, 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 I'm also providing some templates uh, in my shop, and I think it's something that is really helping people, so uh, it's good that you have that available because uh, there is some people that are really struggling to create those documentation. Uh, mm. There is hours of thinking here, what they have to mm. put inside, which boxes, which information, which thing to gather, and here by having a template that is already filled, um, I mean, if it saves you a lot of time and you, are, you don't have to ask a lot of questions, because mainly it was created by experts that know what they are talking about, which is also good. Exactly. So please go to the to Farming Med Limited and uh, just check what uh, what is available from from there. Because I think, as I've said, it will help you a lot. Don't uh, don't just try by yourself. You can lose a lot of time, and you can also uh, provide uh, maybe some failure and uh, not succeed. Um, are you offering also some consulting for the for people? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we do offer, we, we assist a lot of companies uh, in, in many ways. Um, sometimes it's just it's consulting, but sometimes it's actually hands-on doing the validation. Because one area which we didn't mention also, again, because this is limited time that we have to discuss this subject, is transit um, testing. Ah, uh, yeah, true. Uh, 
is validation of the product. Once you've validated it, where, where, uh, the machine's been validated, let's say you're doing packaging, but you also then have to um, validate the transportation testing. You're trans if you're, you're distributing the product from X to Y, that it, the X to Y could be 200 miles uh, in one direction, but it could be 2,000 miles in an air freight and shipping freight, which undergoes lots of climate, climatical challenges and um, all sorts of different um, altitude or um, uh, movement, etc. All of that has to be incorporated. So what we what we can provide is we can provide the package which gives you the consultancy. We provide the consultancy and the advice. We can even write up the documentation, uh, or we can just provide the templates and guide uh, companies to fill in the blanks. So there's many different ways that we can assist. No, I think it's it's really great, and uh, yeah, I really miss this one transportation. I remember we have done some of those tests. We we send the products by plane. Uh, we it arrives yeah. to our office in California, and then it has to come back, and we have to inspect if everything is fine. We have to put the temp tails inside to see if the temperature yeah. is too high, too low, etc. So yeah, there was a lot of things that were ha have to be done. So yeah, it's really. It's really, uh, if I can say, a science. So uh, I think, yeah, call call Adnan <laughs> to help you because uh, <laughs> don't do that by yeah, yourself. Sorry. It's a nightmare, Drew, to be honest. I've, I've, I've always used consultant for that and it's really a nightmare. So, uh, so yeah. do that. Okay, Adnan. Thanks. So, um, yeah, if people want to follow up with you, where they have to go? Um, yeah, so you can have a look at our website, www.farmimed.com. So that's P-H-A-R-M-I with a hyphen M-E-D.com. Um, and there's also there's a, a shop facility on that, which will take a, take you to our other platform, which is the farmymedtemplates.com. So that's www.farmymedtemplates, all one word, dot com. So great. Yeah, uh, be careful. Farmymed is not only for pharmaceuticals, because it's yeah. what I was thinking at the beginning when I was uh, talking to Adnan. Uh, but yeah, I discovered that no, it's also medical devices. So Farmymed is also for medical devices. If you need anything, go to the web uh, to the website yeah. and uh, contact Adnan. He will really help you. So Adnan, really thank you for your help. Uh, and I hope... Uh, yeah, that you will get a lot of contacts from from this uh, from this uh, podcast episode, and uh, please, yeah, I try to send him also the question through LinkedIn. I think you are also reachable through LinkedIn, sure. uh, so that people can uh, can go and ask you uh, any question uh, they need for in process absolutely. validation. I hope, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good. So uh, for the audience, so thank you for listening to this uh, podcast episode. Uh, don't forget to go to your uh, preferred platform. So uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, to just provide a small review, please. Uh, it's really helping me. Uh, and also to the YouTube channel, if you have not already subscribed. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel and provide uh, provide also some comments if you, if you have anything you want me to, uh, to also talk about or to provide. And uh, yeah, uh, don't uh, forget also uh, that that uh, EUMDR is still coming. So uh, don't uh, put anything on pause for now. There is a lot of things to do. And process validation is one maybe of the topics that people have also to put for EUMDR uh, because yeah, it will answer a lot of questions in terms of the requirements from, uh, from, from this uh, regulation. Okay, so Adnan, so thank you for your help. Thank you for your support and I wish you a nice day. Thank you. 